Well, hello everybody. I'm John Van Alstyne, CEO and President of ICAR, the principal provider of technical training, as well as technical information and services that supports the collision repair industry in the US and internationally. We stand for cars fixed right, or as our vision calls, complete safe and quality repairs for the ultimate benefit of the consumer. As some of you may know, we had a great auto line this week roundtable plan for ICARs navigating a new era of collision repair conference. However, like many organizations, we had to cancel this event due to attendee travel restrictions related to the coronavirus. Today, however, I'm excited to share that the show must go on and we're able to bring you the same great roundtable discussion, just in a virtual format, focused on advanced driver assistance systems or ADAS in the automotive market impact. Today's complex advanced vehicles are rolling out with more ADAS features than ever before. And this proliferation has many opportunities and considerations for the entire industry. We're pleased to welcome these incredible collision repair industry subject matter experts and good friends of ICAR, including Mike Anderson, who works closely with repair facilities of all sizes, Jake Rodenroth, who's in the heart of the ADAS space, and Sean Carey, who works not only with repair shops, but also more broadly across the industry with insurers, OEMs, and suppliers. And my thanks to John McElroy for your great moderating role on this important topic. So with no further ado, here's your host for the show, John McElroy. Thanks for that, John. And good morning, everybody. Let me go through what we're going to be doing today. We're actually going to re be recording this discussion coming up as one of my television programs. So I will shortly uh, throw this to the, uh, the audience and let me go through everything that we're going to go through. We'll go with uh, about a 25, 26 minute panel discussion here, talking all about ADAS and how that's going to be affecting uh, car repair. Uh, I'm going to end that show and then pause a minute. And then we're going to open it up questions for all of you in the audience. And you can see we, we've already got people signing in in the chat room. So pay attention to what we're talking about and you'll be able to ask the panelists after about a half hour discussion, what we're going to be doing. And as I said, I'm, I'm going to repeat much of this in just a moment. So uh, Katie and Carmen, uh, why don't we get started? Welcome to a special live edition of AutoLine This Week, brought to you by RSM, providing audit, tax, and consulting services in the middle market automotive industry and by ICAR, serving the collision repair industry since 1979. And now, here's your host, John McElroy. I wanna thank you all for joining us on AutoLine this week. We're doing something a little bit different today. We're not in the studio. We were supposed to be in Phoenix at the ICAR conference, but that got canceled because of the coronavirus. But the show must go on. So we're going to have our panel discussion done here, bringing in other people via the internet. Thank goodness we've got that kind of technology. ICAR is the Collision Auto Repair Association that really makes sure that cars get repaired properly. Automakers are adding all kinds of safety technology to their cars right now, which what they call ADAS, A-D-A-S, or Advanced Driver Assist Systems. This is the kind of technology that underlies things like blind spot detection, lane keeping, and even most importantly, automated emergency braking. But if your car gets in a fender bender or an accident, how do you make sure all these sensors are properly calibrated and aimed? We've got to make sure that that's going to be happening. So joining me for today's panel discussion are Mike Anderson, the CEO of Collision uh, Advice, Sean Casey is the president and CEO of SCG Management Consultants, and Jake Ruddentroff is the director of industry relations at Aztec. And I want to thank all three of you for joining me on today's discussion. Thank you. It's an honor. Thanks, John. Mike, why don't I start with you? Uh, so much ADAS technology coming on to cars today. By the end of next year, it's pretty much mandated that all automakers have to put this on everything that they build. How's that changing the nature of the repair business? 
You know, I think it's uh, changing it quite a bit. I think that collision repairers are challenged with uh, making sure they have the accurate tooling and equipment. And more importantly is I think that it's changing the way that we interact with customers. Um, it seems like most consumers, when they come in, they're more concerned with does the paint match. And I think from a consumer perspective that consumers, while they need to be happy if the paint matches, they need to be more concerned with, you know, what is the things that they can't see? Because a lot of the consumers today are, you know, for example, my 83 year old dad, you know, he trusts his backup camera to make sure it's guiding him properly. So I think for collision repairs, it's a, a much more serious, um, you know, area that we have to take on in regards to repair for the consumers to ensure safe and proper repair. Thanks for that, Mike. Sean, uh, what have you got to add to that? I think the business fundamentals change, John. I think, uh, thanks for having me, by the way. I think the business fundamentals change. Um, ADAS has features on vehicles, of course, will enable uh, us all to drive in a more safe fashion and to stay within the confines of the roads. I think for as it impacts on the collision repair industry, uh, the insurance industry, the OEMs, um, we're going to go through some fundamental changes of business processes and practices. And it's an industry that's already starved of skilled technicians. It's an industry that's already starved of the technical information required to repair the vehicles. And, and hopefully everybody will step up um, and put the car at the center of what they do. I think if we focus on the car, follow the car, as I say in most of my presentations, put that at the center of what you do. If you do the right thing by the car, you'll have done the right thing by the customer. And typically, if you've done both of those, you'll have done the right thing uh, for yourself as well. So it's a fundamental change in the business process. Jake, let's get your uh, input on that. How do you see all this ADAS technology coming into cars changing the automotive repair business? Well, I look at it as a, a considerable challenge for all repairs, not just collision repairs, but mechanical, uh, certainly glass professionals, PDR technicians, uh, everybody in the space, whether you're working in a dealership or you're working in an independent garage or a body shop, everybody is facing this advanced driver assist uh, systems for the very first time. So they're learning not only the systems and how, what makes them work, uh, but also the calibration steps and prepping that vehicle for calibration uh, in a proactive way. If you wait till the end of the repair process uh, in any of those verticals, uh, you create additional downtime and a bad customer experience. And we have to understand the customer is changing too. Um, a lot of digital natives coming into the uh, into the space and they're buying cars, uh, and they understand what it, what uh, you know forward forward collision warning is, what you know how their uh, blind spot monitoring works, and all those kinds of things. So I think that it's a considerable opportunity and a challenge for the repairers to uh, educate themselves not only on the systems. Uh, but certainly the calibration steps. And the last thing, you know, one other thing I would tell you is that even fundamental skills that we have done for years, things like four wheel alignments, windshield changes, taking bumper covers off, those kinds of things have changed. So I would tell repairers, don't assume that you know it. Go and research how that vehicle's process works around a windshield change or a four wheel alignment. And you'll find that there's been an added step because of ADAS calibration. Great points, Mike. Uh, uh... We just heard a little bit of what tech should be aware of. What's your advice to the techs? You know, I have to tell you, it all starts with research in the OEM repair procedures. Um, you know, I think a lot about the building industry and, you know, like you've got certain codes you have to meet in regards to if you build a house, certain electric codes that you have to meet, or if you're going to pour concrete, certain, you know, codes you have to meet to co comply with city or county guidelines. And I think for us, the building code for the vehicle when we do a repair is absolutely the OEM repair procedures. You know, much like what Jake just said, something as simple as replacing a windshield may require a specific procedure to calibrate the compass in the rearview mirror or more or less uh, we also know that a lot of windshields today are almost like computer display devices so we have to make sure the cameras are aimed properly so i think it all starts with the own repair procedures should dictate the way that the vehicle is repaired yeah john do you got something to, to add to that what should the techs be aware of and do you have any suggestions for them i do i think i mean we're hearing a great deal about repair procedures and, and the, the pulling of repair procedures and, and adhering to them I think it goes beyond it for the techs. I think they have to conceive a repair plan. I think repair planning will become something far more prevalent in the industry and in the repairers and in the technician's mind, because with the interaction of these ADAS parts, with the interaction of any parts on the cars, so let's face it, we, we've had technology in vehicles for a very long time. I think a plan of how you're going to set about that repair, which includes how you're going to diagnose it, um, what parts and what procedures take place in what process order, uh, to make sure that we're in sync uh, with the needs of the vehicle. 
and then what are the calibration systems required afterwards so it's one thing to talk about oem repair procedures uh, and i i completely you know agree let's pull them every single time but out of that we have to start thinking about repair planning uh, because there are intricacies there are one-time use parts there are various things that aren't always obvious until you put the plan together of how you're going to repair the car so i think technicians will will come to terms of the fact that they have to think more tactically about the start to the finish of the repair and not just the pieces that they're working on yeah you guys are making some great points here jake what i find so interesting is with all these different procedures that you're all talking about it seems to me that there's a real opportunity for the repair industry with all this ADAS technology coming onto cars. Yeah, it, it would seem that way, John, but I'll tell you the frustrating part for us as a company is that we, we have five full scale calibration centers that are dedicated facilities to doing this. Uh, and they're all in major cities, they're NFL cities. I mean, we there's a lot of people there. We have a lot of customers in those cities, um, but we really struggle to keep them busy. We literally only average about five to ten, five to seven cars a day, maybe. Uh, and when you think about how many 2020 models and 19 and 18 models have this type of technology, um, when you think about it from a diagnostic perspective, my company has already uh, performed diagnostic repairs on over 14,000 2020 models alone this year already. And yet our calibration numbers are very small compared to that. So the point is that the shops just don't know when they need us. They don't know when we, they should call us, when they should schedule that ADAS calibration. And that is the frustrating part. So I, I hate to say that I feel that there's a lot of vehicles that are roaming the road right now that were not properly calibrated or not calibrated at all uh, following a repair. And so those are the kinds of things that we're, we're trying to screen that message to, to research every little thing that you do on that car uh, to make sure you don't miss a critical step. Sean, are you finding the same sort of thing happening out there in the field that we have these needs for ADAS calibration and it's not happening? I think the data would prove it's not happening, John. I think we're finding that there is, um, the need isn't yet fully recognized by the industry as a, as a whole. We're, we're on a path, we're on a good path towards repairing cars properly, but as with all things business, business gets in the way, right? And so there are cost implications, there are time implications, and there's compensation implications attached to that. Uh, and they will have to be addressed at a more strategic level, at the sort of strategic level with the OEMs and the insurance companies uh, and the large MSOs who are, you know, I know from firsthand experience, meeting this full on. And they're having those conversations and those conversations are being driven by the need to do the right thing by the vehicle to repair the car properly so yes there'll be business opportunities which is i think was your question will we go from zero to 100 in 10 weeks no we're not going to do that this is an industry that has typically waited for things to happen to it what i do see here though far more readily than i have in the past is an industry that's getting very proactive in this space. And it's thanks to the education that ICAR is bringing into the scene. It's thanks to the car companies for certain stepping back into the industry. They will begin to make the consumers more aware. And as they do that, then the consumers will begin asking the right questions. And that will lead to a more ubiquitous use of the right processes and procedures to make sure these ADAS uh, parts are all working in sync. Yeah, Mike, let's get your input on this too. What should the, the collision auto repair industry be doing? Automakers, insurers, I, I mean, it, it, it's a whole ecosystem that's got to make uh, consumers more aware of this. Yeah, absolutely right. You know, I think there's a lot of training that has in the past only been available to dealership body shops or dealership service centers. And I think a lot of this training has to be opened up to the independent repair facilities. Um, you know, independent repair facilities, as we know, are repairing the majority of the vehicles on the road that are in an accident. And I also think that, again, from a collision repair standpoint, something as simple as replacing a mirror, even, you know, if your mirror gets clipped and you hit something, even something like that may require calibration or even something as minor as a bumper. You know, what's pretty interesting to me is when you review a lot of the owner's manuals that are provided to the owner when they buy a new vehicle, there are a lot of these um, precautions or warnings in the owner's manuals that will state to the owner, if your bumper's even in a slight accident, you need to have it inspected, you know, by a repair facility. So I think, 
you know, for shops, I think it's really important that they can't take anything for granted. And as much like Jake said, anything that we used to just replace a mirror, we do it in 10 or 15 minutes, that could require, you know, a four wheel alignment just to go and calibrate a camera. So it's much more in depth. And I think it just starts with education and collaboration between the OEMs, as well as the shops that repair the consumer's vehicles. Mike, as you know, iCar started a uh, body shopology where yes. consumers can get an app to make sure that they go to the proper kind of iCar certified repair facility. Do we need something like that for ADAS? You know, I absolutely I do. I think that, you know, you, for a consumer, I think they've got to be able to find a shop that has the ability, meaning the training, but also the proper equipment in order to do these calibrations. So I think anything we can do to educate the consumer so they're making a smart selection for who repairs their vehicle is absolutely critical to our industry. And one of the things I love about Body Shopology is that when you go to Body Shopology, it actually gives you the ability to actually select, you know, all the shops that are iCar Gold class. But if you have a Honda, for example, and I go to iCar's website, Body Shopology, it actually will allow me to select to see which shops are certified by Honda and Honda has a program called Pro First. So I think other OEMs that can embrace that, I think it helps the consumer to make a wiser decision. Jake, your input, what do you think? Uh, an ADAS kind of body shopology or do you have other ideas too? Well, I certainly think a mechanism, I like the mobile app idea, um, but people need to understand from both the consumer level and from the repairer level that this is only the beginning. Um, you know, electrified vehicles have kind of snuck under the radar because ADAS gets all the uh, all the press and the autonomous cars get all the press. But the reality is, can anybody name a, a manufacturer that doesn't make a hybrid or an EV? And they're all going that way. And I'll tell you, as a kid that's been in cars for a long time, they change everything that you think you know about a car uh, as far as EVs and hybrids go. So um, I, I certainly think incorporating the, uh, the safety and, and personal protection around those vehicles uh, is another critical step along with the ADAS. I believe that the ADAS calibrations are going to get easier. They're going to get faster. The tooling and processes will get better. Um, so it, it, there's a lot to learn. But before we can decide we're going to do this calibration as an industry, we need to fully understand the, the, uh, the actual requirement. And Sean, yeah, some of your ideas, you know, how do we get the word out to consumers? Well, I think the OEMs will take that role, John. I think uh, the OEMs have made it a mission to re-engage with the space. And the space is as broad as the claims and collision space uh, right through to consumer education. So, you know, I think about what OnStar has been doing with General Motors for over 20 years and uh, Ford Pass and the developments that are being made in things such as that. Um, you see the latest communications are around OEMs and insurers working together on insurance programs. So I think we'll see a great deal more of it and the OEMs will not lose sight of the consumer um, because that's their lifeblood. Um, we've done a terrible job as an industry of looking after the consumer once the vehicle has gone in and ultimately come out of the repair shop. So whether it's through the telematics that exist in the vehicle, the connected car that I've been talking about for so many years now, what we're beginning to see is a more educated consumer. And once we get there, we will then be in a really good place where engineers are making decisions on what and how a vehicle should be repaired rather than accountants, for want of a better term, or an economic decision. I've often said you can't have an economic solution to an engineering problem. And I think that's where the, the OEMs will come in. GM's got 22,000 engineers working on vehicles. How, how could we possibly question that they've got the engineering manpower and the knowledge uh, to be able to communicate that into an industry and to a market and to a consumer and then deny that we would do anything different to what the engineer for the vehicle is suggesting. It's a huge education issue. I think it's going to get addressed. I think all parties are working towards it. Nobody wants a car going back on the road in an unsafe condition. And Schoolology, uh, so Schoolology, uh, the iCar tools, the various locator tools that the OEMs are bringing out uh, will all identify shops capable of repairing those cars. Mike, within the shops themselves, uh, here we got all this ADAS technology creating concerns in collision repair. Could technology come to the rescue? What about using augmented reality to help guide techs as to what to do? Yeah, so you know, I was recently at a conference where there was a um, software company that was introducing some hardware uh, that would kind of be like you know, Google Glasses or something like that. So 
while I do think that that could be a solution, I think we're still really far away from that. So again, I think it sounds good in you know theory, but I just think we're so far away from that. And the other thing is, is that you know it's like you may go to one area. One of the problems with the OEM websites is they're not standardized. So where I may find a calibration process for an Audi may be totally different where I would find it at in the OEM software or the for a Toyota, for example. So while I think that hardware could help us to maybe ease the solution, I just don't think we're that close to that right now. So it's still some old fashioned, just taking the time, looking up the OEM repair procedures, making sure you have the equipment. But also I think it's just familiarity. And I think that's where the OEMs, I can tell you uh, uh, Nissan Infiniti, Toyota Lexus, Honda Acura, um, General Motors, they are all right now in the process of conducting classes around the country to educate the uh, collision repairers or the people that have to assess the vehicles and damage on how to use their uh, um, OEM websites to find the procedures and how to navigate them. So I think that's the short-term solution is education through training. Yeah, great point. And so Jake, love to get your input on this as well. Augmented reality or other things like more standardized websites, more training, wh where do you think it should go? Well, you know, like Mike said, the, the root cause to all of this, even if we step away from ADAS and go back to collision repair, you know, when I moved over from mechanical, I was looking around for the manual that told me how to put a quarter panel on. And uh, when I got into body shop space, they were like, oh, we had a guy who's been doing it 30 something years. He just does it. And so that's a big mistake. And it's a bad habit that will not vote, vote well for vehicles that have advanced body structures that are aluminum and carbon fiber and things like that. And certainly around the, uh, the technology around ADAS and camera systems and things like that. There's way too much tribal knowledge being used to repair these cars and not actual specification. And so those are the kinds of things that we have got to break those habits and dedicate the time to researching everything. And certainly I hope technology can play a role where we can integrate some mobile apps and, and access the information, have a system of checks and balances to make sure it was read and applied, all those kinds of things. I, I hope those things come along. But the reality is, you know, my dad always told me, he said, hey, well, you know, I'll give you a calculator when you can do it on paper, okay? So you need to understand how to find it a manual way before you just go grab the calculator. Sean, the reason all this ADAS technology is coming in is to make cars safer by having fewer accidents. Does this potentially pose a threat to the collision auto repair business? Because like I said, as of the end of 2021, every car built, at least in the U.S. market, has got to have, have this technology. Yeah, I mean, from a strategic perspective, from a landscape uh, of the claims industry, we're going to see less claims. There's no question about that. Um, because the, the, the small end vehicles, the small uh, bumpers, uh, rear to front bumpers incidents won't happen. You know, you, the, the cars just won't simply make that uh, mistake. They'll take over and, and not allow those incidents to take place. Uh, I think the industry would need be less concerned about the number of vehicles available for repair uh, and more concerned about repairing them correctly at this point in time. Although we're seeing the onset of reduced uh, frequency, I don't think it makes its way down to the collision repair shops for a year or two yet, probably three or four to be more truthful. Uh, and I don't think it, it sort of diminishes the size of the market because severity will go up. That's that's inevitable. And you can't do the scanning and diagnostics. You can't do the calibration and repair procedures, pulling and repair planning uh, without adding time into the equation. So less repairs, higher cost of a per repair, but not a, it's not a declining market. I think the market uh, from a dollar and, and a volume perspective stays the same. I think we'll see a reduction in shops. This is going to be a very difficult market for the number of shops we have right now to step up, get the training, the staff, the equipment, uh, and then stay on top of all these procedures, the skills required. Um, so it is going to have a big impact, but I think we're a couple of years away. If I can comment, though, on the AI. Yeah, please. Um, I think we're a little ways away uh, from AI as we know it and see it here. But I do think we're taking steps to enable ourselves to take the best use of AI as we know it now. Clearly, AI, as it's been described by certain people in the industry who are, who are putting it out there, is saying, you know, we can take a claim at the side of the road and take some photographs or video and get it appraised and properly triaged to the right place. I think that is helpful. I think that's very valuable indeed. And I think that we, we can reduce and remove a great deal of wasted inefficiency from the industry if we were to, to use those components of AI that are available. As for Google goggles on the tech, uh, you know, off my pay scale, I wouldn't have a clue when that might be ready for market. 
Okay. Mike, what, what do you think? Is ADAS a threat in terms of reducing accidents and maybe not as many repairs? Or like Sean just said, because the nature of the repairs themselves will become more involved and complicated, it's going to be business or, you know, a, a similar level of at least dollar business for the industry. Yeah. So I think that, you know, we really have to look at the, what's really driving this, right? And while it is to reduce accidents, I think more importantly, it's to reduce uh, fatalities as a result of an accident, right? Um, all the statistics I've seen in the United States, we don't rank very well against other modern countries in regards to, you know, fatalities per population from vehicle accidents. So I think we have to really understand what's driving that. The second thing, though, I think is that while claims count will absolutely decline, I think it's going to be a very small amount, you know, two to three percent every year, unless the government offers some incentives or something to get people to trade in or order vehicles vehicle without ADAS for a vehicle that does have ADAS. But I also think that you're going to see the hairy homeowner market start to shrink. I'll give you an example. Recently, I was writing an estimate on a vehicle uh, to repair it, and uh, we had to replace uh, uh, something that required us to remove the wiper arms. Well, when I went to research the own repair procedures on how to replace the wiper arm, it told me that I actually had it, uh, it asked me, does the vehicle have rain sensor or not? And so what happened is I found out the vehicle had rain sensor. And what we had to do was we actually had to hook up a factory scan tool and we had to have somebody spray water at the rain sensor by the rear view mirror to calibrate the wiper arm. So something as simple that a hairy homeowner may do, right, a do it yourselfer, they may take and just swap out their own wiper arms, right? I think you're going to see more of that work is going to have to go back to the collision repair center or dealership service department to calibrate something as simple as a wiper arm. So while I don't think that's going to offset the reduction of claims totally, I do agree with Sean, right? You're going to see severity go up, uh, even though car count may go down. I think you'll see some shops that go out of business and nothing personal. They probably need to go out of business because they're not qualified to fix vehicles properly. So I think a combination of that, I think collision repairs are still in a good place. I don't think it's doom and gloom. I think uh, the runway is still very open for us. Well, good. Jake, if you had advice to give to the automakers as they install all this ADAS equipment on their cars, would, would you have any advice for them? Yeah, certainly when they're developing uh, these systems, they really need to think about who's going to repair them, uh, what the environment is going to be like to repair them. Um, some of the current procedures that are published ask for enormous uh, areas of space to do this. Uh, no metal on the ground, those kinds of things. And, um, you know, when you think about dealerships and places where these, these calibrations are being performed, um, the environment plays a big role. Um, but they also need to think about how it's insured. You know, I, I mean, I'm not a big fan of uh, just replace every bumper cover. That one, I think, hurts the repairability of the car and the profitability for the collision repair. I would love to see some companies come up with some innovative ways that allow radar to pass through those repaired bumper covers safely. Uh, we're not there yet, but I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of that because I love the industry so much. Um, so I, I think that as they're developing these systems, you know, think about people that are going to have to interface with them and service them. Think about, you know, the state of California that has bumper stickers on their back bumpers for the HOV lane. I mean, little things like that uh, come into play. And so um, the last thing I want to tell you when you talked about the uh, the artificial intelligence, I know for a fact that um, Porsche uh, actually hired a, a group of gamers to develop an a environment to simulate real world, real world uh, cases where a kid walks out in the street and how is the Porsche going to respond? How is its ADAS systems going to respond? So they, they created a virtual environment to test the systems before they actually crash test. Um, so I think hopefully you'll see some of that kind of stuff enter the aftermarket to where we could simulate crashes virtually um, on repaired vehicles because it's certainly something we don't want to be out in a customer's car test driving and try to simulate. So, um, so yeah, it, there, there's a lot of things I think could, that can uh, help the industry move forward in that regard. Real good. Look, we're going to have to wrap this up. This has been a fascinating discussion on my part. In fact, I'm going to have to go back and watch the show again and take notes. That's how good you guys have been. But I want to thank all three of you. Mike Anderson with the uh, CEO of Collision Advice, Sean thank Casey, you. President and CEO, SCG Management Consultants, Jake Roddentroth, the Director of Industry Relations at Aztec. You guys did an awesome job. Thank you very much today. Thank you, John. Thank, thank you, John. Okay, good job. And now we're going to open it up uh, to the audience. And I see that we've been getting all kinds of questions uh, coming in. And let's get to that right now. And remember, I, I, for you, those of you who are watching live right now, you've got the chat room there. Uh, I'm going to try to get to, to some of them, but let's throw out the first thing. Uh, and here's a good one from uh, another Sean. Sean, let's throw this to you. Is there anything as a consumer I should be doing to be on the lookout for when I'm getting a used vehicle? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I I think the it, so as it relates to the collision repair segment, obviously just to ask the question if it's been in a in a repair, a previous had a previous repair. And that used to be a negative, um, whereas I don't necessarily think it is these days with OEM certification coming out with, uh, you know, large MSOs, the Calibers, Gerbers, Service Kings of the World and so on, uh, all going through formal repair processes. Chances are that if that vehicle has been repaired and, you know, at an ICAR Gold shop, for instance, I think the consumer can be fairly confident uh, that it's been repaired correctly. Um, you know, should you or could you ask for the trouble codes to be scanned? I, I guess, but I don't know how many consumers would be that technically biased to ask for that. Okay, uh, Mike, here's another one that's uh, come in. Uh, if you're a consumer and your car has been repaired, how do you know if it's all properly aligned or not? You know, I'll tell you, um, I think for a consumer, it's that's the scary part. Really, there's not a valid way for them without doing their own research to verify that. So I think that's why it's really important that consumers choose a certified shop by that OEM manufacturer that's met the training and equipment requirements. So I think, it, first of all, for the consumer to protect themselves, it starts out with selecting the right shop. Again, a shop that has met the training and equipment requirements to be recognized by that OEM. I think that's number one. Uh, the second thing is, is and I'm probably a little aggressive in my opinion here, but I know right now, like if I buy a used car from you, I still have to take it and have it pass an inspection to make sure that, you know, the tires are good, the brakes are good and headlights are good. Personally, I believe, and again, I'm very aggressive in my opinion here. I believe that after a vehicle has been in an accident, maybe we might have to look at some type of laws where it says if a vehicle has been in an accident, it has to pass some type of inspection. And again, one of the things we need to understand is that just hooking a scan tool up to a vehicle does not necessarily mean that the adaptive cruise control is working properly. It may not trigger a DTC. So I think that for the consumer, it really starts with making the right choice in the beginning and doing their homework and selecting the right shop, asking the shop, do you have the training equipment? Give me a shop tour, make sure you have that. And, you know, again, just validating that. Uh, I guess there are companies that do what's called post repair inspections, but I can't always say that all those companies actually know what they're looking for. So I think it boils down to selecting the right shop the first time. Hey, John Van Alstein, let's get you into this. Uh, you know, earlier in the recorded portion of the program, we talked about body shopology and asks if maybe we need something like that for ADAS. Is ICAR looking into anything like that? Well, it's certainly something that we could look into. Um, you know, I would say that ICAR has been um, pretty active on this front for several years now. We started educating the industry back in like 2014 timeframe through our conferences. Uh, which actually you helped moderate back in that time frame, 2014 in the 2016 time frame, where we brought speakers in to talk about the advancements that are coming, people from like Bosch and the OEMs. Uh, and, and that's really taken off, I think, across the, uh, um, across the industry. We just recently rolled out updates to our uh, training programs and requirements uh, for technicians to be what we call platinum status and also for shops to be gold class status. And so one of the uh, additional requirements that uh, has been identified is the need for um, shops and technicians to be properly educated and the shops to be capable of doing this type of work. Um, those requirements are, are just starting to kick in. Um, new shops to gold class will be uh, required to take shop level uh, uh, electrical diagnostics uh, uh, training requirements. Uh, and that'll roll out through uh, the rest of our shops going into 2021. 20, so there could be an opportunity to do that. Um, it's kind of similar to shops that are capable of doing aluminum repairs, for example. And we do see a similar uh, potential need there to, to get that level of clarity as well. Well, good. Hey, we've got a Tesla fan in uh, the chat room, BTRT5 or TS, excuse me. Uh, Who's pointing out over-the-air updates? Anybody want to jump into that? Is potentially over-the-air updates part of this solution for repairing cars with ADAS technology? Mm. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, certainly over-the-air updates are something that OEMs are moving towards. Everybody, of course, have heard of uh, GM OnStar, um, but it's important to understand that every OEM has their own version of telematics. So, you know, things like Kia Uvo, um, Mercedes-Benz Embrace, uh, Acura and Honda Link, you know, so they all have that connectivity to a mobile app or a vehicle owner um, to where they can push certain over-the-air updates. They're not as integrated as a, as a Tesla product where they can actually change driving dynamics and suspension and things like that. 
Um, but I think that that's in the near future. I think those are things that, that they're going to. Um, I know with the new Cadillac CT5, they went to a global B architecture that processes 4.5 terabytes of data an hour. Um, that is five times more than what other GM vehicles currently process. So no secret that OEMs are going that direction. Um, and they, they will have that type of connectivity to both their dealer network and their vehicle owner. Yeah. Sean or Mike, anything to add about over the year updates? Yeah, John, I'd love to jump in. I, I know that uh, I, I work with the OEMs quite closely. I think most people know um, th there's very clearly the opportunity exists to send a repair package up to the vehicle or up to whoever it is, is going to be repairing that vehicle provided the OEM is aware of who they are and that they're certified or authorized in some description to repair those cars. Uh, the OEMs are way ahead here in terms of capability. It's just market readiness and it's just market acceptance and it's market conditions, and frankly. Um, but yeah, I, I see a future where we'll have a, a package of data that is available with the vehicle when it turns up at a repair shop. I don't think we're talking years and years into the future. I think we're talking pretty soon. I also think we're in a situation where once that vehicle has been repaired and it pings the OEM again, I don't think we're far off from the, the message being able to get back to the car to say, hey, I'm not in good shape. I haven't been repaired properly. This is wrong. Do not let this car out the door. So over the air, uh, telematic parcel, parcel, parcels of information, all of those things are very real, they're very close, and it's just getting the right market conditions for that to be able to take place. As we see more and more sophisticated repair groups in the in the collision industry that can that, that have stood up significant IT companies, uh, you know, I'm thinking the likes of, of a caliber who've got a, a diagnostic company, they've got an IT department that's sizable, they've got the capabilities to be able to work one-to-one -one with the OEMs and, and with the insurance companies to get that over-the-air telematics data that really does focus on the car. Uh, is the car in good health? I don't think we're that far off. Well, good. And John, I apologize. I've been calling you Sean Casey. It's Sean Carey. Excuse I've me for called, that. I've been called worse, John. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, any thoughts on OTA or no? Yeah, you know, I absolutely think that the OEMs, I think the OEMs will get there sooner to be able to do that, sooner than the maybe the American public is willing to accept it. You know, if you take, again, I'll reference my 83-year-old dad. He's still, for that depression, you know, times where he's real concerned with privacy, right? He doesn't want GMs on start to know where he's at or where he's driving or anything else. But you get my 30-year-old niece, you know, she's more concerned with uh, comfort and safety features than she is privacy concerns. So I think it's going to take a little bit of a generational shift in the American public and plus the ability for cars to be connected. But I think we could see that, like Sean said, it would surprise me if we see that within the next two years. Yeah. John Van Alstein, we got an interesting comment here that I, I'm going to throw to you uh, in the, the chat room. Auto Tech Collision points out the insurers need educating. Sure. Uh, he goes on to say, we had a large insurer deny reimbursing their customer for required ins safety inspection because they didn't feel it was necessary. What, what, are, you, what are your thoughts? How, how, did, how does ICAR get the insurance industry more engaged? Well, interestingly, uh, you know, ICAR is uh, designed uh, to serve the entire industry, if you will. So while we educate a lot of shops, we also educate a lot of insurers as well. And so it's really important that insurers understand, um, you know, the same scope of, of knowledge that, uh, that shops are required. Um, and so the objective there is to, uh, through that education, to also draw uh, closer on alignment. Yeah, well, good. Let's see, we've got uh, another question uh, here uh, that it came in again from Sean. Uh, where does a techni technician go to get the proper training? So I can, I, I can jump on that. So, yeah, so yeah. I can tell you um, that I know, like, for example, Toyota and Lexus, um, they have been working with um, uh, one of their counterparts uh, down in Texas to develop some hands-on calibration training. I can tell you that uh, there are three other OEMs that I'm very familiar with that are absolutely working on hands-on training classes. So the OEMs are well aware of this. Uh, they're building out the curriculum. Uh, my company, Collision Advice, is actually getting to work with them, as is Jake's company, Aztec, where we're getting the opportunity to work with some uh, of the OEMs to develop calibration training that's very specific to collision repair. 
repairs because the way a dealership does a calibration is on a vehicle that has may not been in an accident before. We're doing calibrations on vehicles where you know the body or unibody could have been shifted or moved, and that's a much more detailed process. So I can absolutely tell you that reach out to the OEMs. The OEMs are doing hands-on training. Um, I do believe iCar will probably come out with some training as well, but I can tell you um, I know of four OEMs specifically that are building hands-on training that will be a three-day class, and it will be very, very technical. And the thing is, is it might, you know, it's not going to be just this you show up. You're going to actually have to perform calibrations and actually pass the class and show that you can do it. I think okay. that bodes well. I think that bodes well for the consumer that gives faith. Uh, you know, I, I also I'll add this. In our industry right now, there's several OEM, OEM manufacturers like Audi, Mercedes, Porsche. Uh, if you're not certified, you can't actually buy certain structural components. It would not surprise me if in the future the OEMs say, "Look, if you're not cal certified, you don't have the right training, and you haven't had the equipment. We may not even sell you this part." And I think that actually would protect the consumer as well. So I think the OEMs can lead the way on this. John, I wanted to I wanted to say that you know if as a technician focus on what you're not good at. If you're a, I was a European technician background and I said you know I don't really know much about Asians and domestics so I'm going to go focus my energy there and find out the resources that those OEMs have for their technicians. And there's a tremendous amount when you log into the service materials and they do require subscriptions and you pay to get in. Uh, but there's a lot of online videos. There's a lot of some of them have self tests and self study programs like executive summaries. When a new car comes out, it tells you front to back what they changed. So, I mean, I, I think the resources are there. You just got to want it bad enough and focus on the things that, like I said, you're not you're not familiar with. You're not good. at. If you're a mechanical technician, you need to understand the body structure. You need to learn that. Right. If you're body, you need to understand mechanical. Um, so I think that we really focus on our comfort zone and we've got to challenge ourselves to get outside of that mold. Okay. Hey, John, I could add to that too. Sure, from jump a, in. From an ICAR perspective as well. So as I mentioned earlier, we had just updated our, our training requirements. And so electrical diagnostics is now one of those uh, uh, specified roles in our training platform. And I would say that we've introduced roughly about a dozen or so related courses in this space. The other thing that we also offer to the industry is technical information and tech support services. So that's our repairability technical support program where we collaborate with the industry and also OEMs where we provide our connectivity to related information. And we also have a uh, staff technical team that takes calls from shops for uh, assistance. So it's kind of a blending of all these things, the OEM initiatives that, that Mike mentioned, uh, but we also cover a lot of that space as well. Hey, John, let's stick with you a minute. We've got a question from uh, Frank Ronaldo in the chat room. He wants to know, how do we get all the players up to speed with the importance of calibrations? And he says, dealers, bill payers, consumers, repair shops. Yeah, well, I think it's kind of what uh, the panelists talked about uh, through the course of the show. It's, it's continuous uh, education and, and reinforcement. Um, and I, I think we're all working on that, um, but it's a it's a broad industry with lots of different, uh, you know, the collision repair industry in the United States, we have approximately 40,000 repair shops. Um, and, um, you know, there's some that are large organizations like Sean Carey uh, uh, mentioned one in particular that has uh, a number of shops, uh, but we have a lot of independents as well. And uh, so it, it's a continuous education awareness. Um, Putting out things like training requirements helps to drive that uh, that behavior shift, and uh, yeah, so I think we're all trying to work to that end. You know, John, if I may jump in there real quick too, another great resource that iCar offers is on iCar's website. They actually have a calibration section of their website that says, here's different vehicles, makes and models, and here's calibrations they require. Anytime you remove a mirror, anytime you remove a bumper cover, you know, maybe that's something iCar could open up to the consumer that would help the consumer to be educated that, hey, if my vehicle gets any of these components get removed or repaired or replaced, it requires a calibration. So John, maybe you could share a little bit from John from iCar about that resource that's on car, iCar's website. Yeah, we call that the uh, OEM calibration requirement search, and it goes through by um, by OEM, by model, and it identifies the content uh, that's in the particular model of your vehicles. Um, it doesn't provide the actual repair procedures. Uh, we refer uh, the industry to the OEM sites for that, as our panelists have been talking about. Uh, clearly accessing those OEM procedures is important, but what this tool does, it provides visibility to the shop when a vehicle comes in. These are the systems that are on that vehicle. Well, good. We got another question here from Sean McElroy. He wants to know, 
How often does a vehicle need to be recalibrated? Is there a general service interval? So it's been my experience that in most of the owner's manuals, it will give you some standards that say if these things happen, it may require a calibration. But I think, Jake, you could probably get to that more clearly. Yeah, one of the advanced driver assist uh, drivers is what I call them. You know, you figure uh, alignments are a pretty heavy maintenance item, right? Most cars require those two times a year, uh, unless it's an exotic or a sports car, and it may even require it more. Um, so I would say they follow your main, your maintenance guide in your in your owner's manual. Um, if you see four wheel alignments, insist on the dealership or and or independent repair facility who's doing them for you uh, to research how the alignment is performed. As a consumer, I would want to see that in writing so that I could follow along as well. Maybe even if I didn't understand it, uh, but I would want to see the camera calibration because if you change thrust angle in an alignment situation, you change the way that camera sees the road. So those are the kinds of things from a maintenance perspective. Um, you definitely want to be mindful of that as you're servicing other components on the vehicles. It's very operation driven. It's not scantle driven, DTC driven, any of those kinds of things. You can't look at it and tell it that it's bad. You got to look at the operations being performed on that vehicle. John, can I jump in for a second on the previous question? Do you mind? Yes. No, no. Go right ahead, Sean. I think we have a million opportunities every month to educate a consumer about uh, the, the right way to repair a car or, or the right systems to repair a car or whether it's been checked for ADAS or calibration or whatever. This industry repairs, you know, 1.2, 1.3 million vehicles every single month. And I think that means we come into contact with 1.2 or 1.3 million customers every single month. Word of mouth has always been a huge marketing tool inside the uh, auto collision repair industry. It, for, forever it was the marketing tool, it was the only marketing tool. When we're letting that vehicle go, when we're passing that vehicle back to a customer, when we've finished a repair, there is your opportunity to tell the next 14 customers, this is how you want the vehicle repaired. And it's about certifying the repair. It's about validating the repair. You know, the kind of work I was at the Verifax conference a week and a half ago. In fact, we all were. Uh, and, and the passion and commitment to that is very, very real inside the industry. So it's simple steps, you know, stop trying to boil the world with AI and all of this technology. Hand your customer a bit of paper, says this car has been repaired to the OEM certified or OEM manufacturer's recommendations. And, and, and don't, don't move away from that. Don't do anything other than that. Repair the car, look after the car, follow the car, do the right thing by the car. And you can educate a million consumers every single month. And if they do as what our marketing gurus of many years ago, the Denny Kiyaharas and Chuck Suklas told us, they'll go and tell 14 people. Uh, and so we're getting a word of mouth out very, very quickly. But kudos to the work that John Van Alstyne's doing over at ICAR, that various others are doing in the industry to get the message out. But a simple step, just talk to the customers that you've repaired. Hey, this is repaired to these standards, it's validated, and that's how you should have the vehicle sent back to the customer. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, also, John, just to comment on that is also just with social media today, right? We have so many different avenues to communicate with a customer, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, whatever the case may be. There's so many chats and forums. So I think uh, Sean brings up a very good point that we have a, a moral responsibility to educate the consumers and create this awareness. John, okay. uh, one thing one thing I wanted to tell you, um, I spoke at a middle school this week, um, by far the hardest thing I've ever done. And uh, I, I think that if we don't engage these young people, um, I, th I look at it as every one of us on this panel, every one of us that's on this call, including, you know, the auto professionals that are on the chat. It is our obligation to grab these young people, bring them in, show them how to change a tire, show them how to check oil on a modern vehicle. And, you know, I, I work with my four year old son. I want him to go, Dad, that car's got radar. That car's got a Ford camera. I mean, we've got to get that vocabulary in them and get them hooked because where are we going to get these technicians if we don't set that hook early? I mean, I remember as a kid being able to tell my dad by the headlights what kind of car that was. And we've got to be able to set that hook with these kids early to get these technicians involved in this in this uh, industry. Great point, Jake. In fact, uh, we got a comment here from Casey Auto Doctor in the, the chat room. It says, I agree with Jake. There's lots of shops that are sending out repaired ADAS equipped cars with sensors out of calibration. Let's, let's move on to the, the next question, though, from Adam Henderson. He says, and this is a really good point, consumer web groups and fan forums are a great resource and insight yeah. to repair methods, considerations, and practices. Could these resources be useful for manufacturers to be involved and learn from? 
Big Anybody fan there. Yeah, a big fan there, Adam. I'm a member of the Volkswagen uh, VW Vortex, which is 40,000 members strong, uh, a big forum. You got to be careful. You got to filter the information you're seeing because some of it is very good. Some of it is kind of questionable. Um, so I think you look at all of it, you digest it and you apply it to the service manual to see who's accurate. Um, but the, Vol the, the forums are excellent. There's literally a forum for everything. Uh, another one of my favorites is carcomplaints.com. They, they show you year by year, model by model on what are the things that people are complaining about. So certainly using lots of those consumer available resources uh, to determine what your car has and what are the requirements um, are really good resources. But just be careful what you're reading, because some people will put like anything, they'll put something out there that doesn't make any sense. But there's also some certified technicians in there that work at dealers that put really good things in there as well. So I would just say read those things with a filter. Yes. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, we look at the comments on our shows and there's trolls out there who are idiots. But to your point, Jake, there's some really good, smart people out there with some very astute comments. Yeah. Anybody else want to jump in on that topic? Yeah, I think that, you know, just as we talk about the pros of communicating through social media platforms, I think uh, one of the things Jake and I always joke about is there's no such thing as a YouTube certified technician. So just yeah. because somebody puts a video <laughs> on YouTube and shows a process doesn't be done doesn't mean it's right. So I think you have to make sure that if you're going to look at things in social media, whether it's a YouTube video or something on Facebook, where the case may be, make sure it's from a credible source. Uh, great point. Okay, back to the, the chat room. David Stronger uh, wrote in, and I, I got to admit, I, I'm not sure I know this. He says, what is the CCC group doing to help solve this problem? So um, I'm not sure if he's talking about CCC in regards to the estimating system, or we have also in our industry, we have a group that's called CCG, which is sort of a collision group. So I'm not sure which one he may be referring to. If he's yeah. talking to CCC1, uh, the management or estimating system company, um, I'm not quite sure what he's asking. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next one then. Auto Tech Collision is back uh, asking, do you see standardized procedures in the future? Uh, they go on to say it would be more affordable to the repair professional if there was a standard tooling that could be used to follow similar procedures. So, so well, working with... Go ahead, Jake. Go ahead, Mike. No, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, yeah one, of the, one, of the, one of the things I think we have to keep in mind is that with the OEM manufacturers, when they select tools or any type of equipment that they're going to acquire, depending on the company, it may be, have to be some type of equipment that's been tested that's available internationally, right, in uh, multiple countries, not just the U.S., right? So I think that impacts it somewhat. But I will also tell you, and Jake can probably attest to this, that we've done comparisons and testing between OEM equipment and then non-approved aftermarket equipment. And I will tell you, there are differences and it cre can create some issues. So the OEM set standards there for a very, very good reason and just not all equipment's made equal. Yeah, what I would add, what I would add to that, John, is that um, you gotta remember that OEMs are competing against each other as well. Um, they, they all want the latest and greatest tech that will attract buyers. And that means integrating different controllers using sensor fusion, like radars and cameras working together uh, to create a new feature that makes that vehicle even more attractive to buy, right? And certainly, you know, seven to ten thousand dollars more than the base model. And now you're trying to convince a vehicle owner to buy it, right? So those OEMs are competing against each other. Um, and when you're trying to apply this technology to a diagnostic network that works with their scan tools and works on 12 volts, it can become a challenge when you're trying to when you're trying to standardize it. So uh, we're hopeful that they come up with some kind of standard that we can use one camera target for everything and one radar target for everything, but. Um, in the foreseeable future, I think there's just going to be there's got to be faster ways to measure the car, faster ways to prep the car. Um, and we hope that we can standardize some of that stuff, not, not just the targets. I would I would also add that the uh, I mean, the OEMs all have their own engineering strategies and they, you know, they design and optimize vehicles for whatever their uh, internal requirements are. And so, you know, content can change. Architecture can change. Uh, and this doesn't apply just to, uh, you know, the ADAS space here. It applies to the entire vehicle. Uh, could be chassis structures, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I think the idea of getting to a standardized approach to designing and engineering a, a vehicle is going to be uh, a long way, a long way off in the, the future, because I think they all uh, try to optimize to their particular uh, requirements. Hey, John, I can tell you with a high degree of certainty that standardization as it's been described is very very unlikely across the oems and across the platforms of vehicles because the engineers you know i mentioned twenty two thousand engineers at gm um th they're not all working with the commonality required for the repairer 
at the end of the at the end of the the life cycle of the vehicle. I think what we can do though, and I know that John van Alstein and I and, and the group over at ICAR have looked very closely in the past uh, period of time, at what commonality does exist and where with some tweaks and modifications, there could be even greater commonality of equipment and tools. I don't think we're a mile away from having some form of a, a common core that was capable of repairing the vehicle up to the point at which it becomes very specialized. And then I think it goes back to Jake's point, I think earlier, or, or might have been Mike's about, hey, if you work on this brand and this make and this model, then specialize in that. But if you try to be all things to all men, then you are in equipment hell and you're in tool hell for a while to come yet. Yeah. John, just to give you. I think some of this also relates to uh, design for repair. Like I, I spoke in Detroit back in uh, May 2018 about the ADAS space as well. And the reason that I was there speaking was to really try to influence the, the car companies and the suppliers about some of the complexity that the panelists brought out about, you know, what's, you know, how are shops equipped to handle this? What are the uh, capabilities required? What's the floor space requirements uh, and all of that. And you know, despite different engineering strategies, there could be maybe different uh, outcomes in terms of, of that repair process. And to Sean's point, you know, uh, one of ICAR's uh, roles is also to collaborate with OEMs. And we are constantly talking about commonization and standardization. Um, I think Mike Anderson brought up the idea of uh, how difficult it can be to navigate uh, OEM procedures because they're they're formatted differently, they're structured differently, uh, and that creates complexity as well. So, so there's a lot of opportunities, I think, for commonization and standardization. Um, and it, I think it goes beyond just engineering the vehicles exactly the same way. John, I, I think you might relate to the. Go, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I, I think, though, that you might see some joint ventures, right, you know, where you might see two vehicle manufacturers that may collaborate. Do I think sure. all of them are going to get on the same page? Absolutely not. But I think we may see some joint collaborations between OEMs, and and that may, uh, you know, help us in some sense. Yeah, sure. John, just to relate to the uh, to the consumers for a, spec for a second here, if you think about all of us on this panel likely have a very different blood type. Um, we may be allergic to certain medicines that some of us are not allergic to, right? And so each of us would have a different diagnosis as we go to a doctor, right? The challenging part is when a doctor looks at a human, the host hasn't changed a whole lot, right? The processes and the medicine continue to change in the collision space and in the mechanical space, the host continues to change and the processes and medicine continue to change. So I would look at it like, you know, what is, uh, what is my vehicle's DNA? What does it require? And how am I going to audit that against a repair if I'm a consumer? Well, good, guys. I, I think we're going to have to wrap this part of the Q&A up right now. There's a lot of questions there. We could probably go on for hours yet. So this is a topic that people are very much interested in. But I got to thank you all. John Van Alstein from ICAR. Mike Anderson from Colli Collision Advice. Sean Carey from SGC Management Consulting and Jake Roderbroth from Aztec. Thanks, you guys. And want to thank all of you who have tuned in as well. Thank you, John. Thank you. This has been a special live edition of AutoLine This Week, brought to you by RSM, providing audit, tax, and consulting services in the middle market automotive industry. And by iCar, serving the collision repair industry since 1979.